the function. His Excellency Sri S. M. Krishna arrives. I would like to welcome the dignitaries already present in the dais. First of all, there's a face I'm sure no, uh, nobody needs an introduction to, uh, Ms. Prabhu. Uh, she's a guest here for the book unveiling. Uh, next to her, uh, we have Mr. Boni Kapoor. Next to him, we have Dr. Javid Cheka. He's a fellow at the Institute of Chinese Studies, New Delhi. Next to him, we have Dr. Shikar Kodapalli, faculty at the Center, of, Center for East Asian Studies, JNU, New Delhi. Next to him, we have Commodore Shri C. Uday Bhaskar. He's a director of Society for Policy Studies, New Delhi. And then we have none other than our own, uh, Dr. Priyan Raghavan, Commissioner, GST Mumbai Central. We also have a guest, that our chief guest is right. Starting the function, I request our Honorable Chief Guest, His Excellency Sri S. M. Krishna and all the other dignitaries to stand up and unveil the book. Excuse me. Sir, please cover the media. We would like to congratulate Dr. Kim Raghun on this occasion. Get to the function in order. Okay, so uh, uh, Tapuji has to leave right now. So thank you so much for uh, coming. Teachers, distinguished authors in writing from across the globe. Today, Leafstar Publishing has 10 grants and publishes over 200 titles a year. Now, I request Sri Swarup Nanda to speak a few words about the book. Hi, a very warm good evening to all of you. Thanks for assembling me all in this kind of corner in minutes and uh, supporting the book. Uh, I'm not an expert on the India-China relationship. I had more of questions than answers. I hope uh, the panelists today will help uh, answer some of my questions. A couple of questions that I had, uh, especially for all you uh, India-China uh, relationship uh, experts. Uh, 
Uh, first part of the question was um, uh, the way Pakistan is going. Would we have two Chinas on both sides of India? China, Pakistan becoming a satellite state of China. And uh, how uh, extreme is the situation at Northeast? Do you actually see uh, a real conflict developing where we could lose the entire of Northeast? During the okay. Moving on, I would request the Honorable Chief Guest, Shri S. M. Krishna, to speak a few words on this occasion. Sir. Mr. Raghavan, distinguished panelists, ladies and gentlemen, I feel it a great honor that I have been asked by Mr. Raghavan to release the revised book that has been written by Mr. Raghu. Let me start by congratulating Mr. Raghu for his work which is being formally released today. I believe this is this has been updated. The earlier publication was done six years back, and uh, I'm sure the updating has been quite useful. It is said that we can choose our friends, but not our neighbors. I think this is a old adage. In, 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 and it is more so in international politics. India and China have been the holders of great civilizational legacies that mankind has known. But we have also had good neighborly relationship over a period of time. But the relationship became a bit uncertain and at times very hostile. As a result of which, today we stand at the threshold of the relationship becoming very hostile. The bilateral ties, though they culminate, uh, they culminate in certain border conflicts, but we continue to engage each other uh, with a, a 
the challenge of trying to mend our fences with each other. But the reason behind the sudden deterioration of the relationship to the extent that uh, of hostility should have taken place, have been subject to intense speculation and debate ever since. It is essential that a true account of the factors that contributed to the discord, which blew into a conflict is placed before the public so that we not only learn from them but are also better placed to avoid the pitfalls when confronted with similar situations in the future. This book performs the remarkable function of presenting before public the factual position regarding the events that took place in the years following independence till the outbreak of hostilities. Foreign policy of India, India was by and large shaped by Jawaharlal Nehru. Because all through the years that he continued as Prime Minister of this country, he continued to be in charge of foreign affairs. That is largely because Pandit Nehru had a deep insight into the, not only the history of India, but also the glimpses of world history also. As a result of which, even while he was fighting for the liberation of our country, he simultaneously continued to be a very keen student of international politics and global relations. I think truly, the foreign policy of India was laid by the Indian National Congress because it had a foreign policy cell which was mostly headed by both Nehru and Dr. Ram Manohar Lohia. Both of them were experts and authorities in their own right. During the 1920s and the 30s, Pandit Nehru was a very keen student of international politics. Nehru had taken keen interest in international affairs from an early age and was an astute observer of the events that took place in Europe and other parts of the world even during the early part of the 19th century. He had warned India and the world about the evils of fascism and damage that governments rooted in such political thoughts could cause to mankind. He had developed a warm personal relations with not only other leaders, but with the leading thinkers and philosophers as well. Thus, Nehru's foreign policy was not a mere statement formulated of promoting interests of our country, 
it was also an expression of its ethical and ideological moorings. China was the cornerstone of Nehruji's foreign policy when it came to bilateral relations. Despite the concerns over actions taken by Beijing with reference to Tibet in 1950, India strove hard to build good relationship with our neighbor across the Himalayas. In the process, relinquishing the rights bequeathed by British administration as part of the Panchashil Agreement signed in 1954. This situation arose as a consequence to one of the major blunders of diplomacy on our part, since our leaders at that time were gullible enough to, to, to take Chinese appeasement and false assurances, credible enough to believe in a peaceful resolution of Tibet and its concerned issues. By unilaterally giving up our rights, we could neither reserve for ourselves an issue, nor could we significantly bargain, we, we could significantly keep it as a bargaining tool in the later border disputes that came up later on. On this specific issue, Nehru was also apprised or warned about the dangers from China and clearly so by Sadar Vallabhai Patel through his letter on 7th November 1950. He said very explicitly in his letters that Chinese still saw India with suspicion and our amiable ways are waste of time with this neighbor. To quote, he said, Chinese do not regard us, their friends, with the communist mentality of Whoever is not with us is against us. It is a significant pointer of which we have to take due note. Despite this, for the lack of faith in the voices inside the government or for romanticizing communist China as a trustworthy partner and hailing Hindi Chini as brothers, Nehru could fathom the importance of this forewarning, couldn't fathom the importance of this forewarning. And we continue to tread the path which led to the 1962 fiasco. Oh, <laughs>